Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday. I cannot believe that it is already December, seeing that it's December 1 today. Wow, has this year flown by. Hopefully, the month of December will be an amazing month for us. We'll see. Who knows? But I hope that you all are doing well. I hope that for the Americans out there that you had a fabulous Thanksgiving week. I hope that you got to spend some quality time with your friends and your families and also got to spend some quality time relaxing for the holiday. Now today we're going to be covering just a few of the Yoga Sutras. Um, as you all know, I traveled last week and the week before on David Zublik's channel, we went over some other things. We did not read through the Yoga Sutras. And so we are quite a bit ahead on this channel, ahead of where we are on the Dark Outpost and reading through the Yoga Sutras, which is totally fine. I don't, I don't mind that we're ahead on this channel, but we're just not gonna try to get too, too, too far ahead. As you guys know, the Yoga Sutras, even though there's only 200 of the sutras, each sutra is packed with so much information that each sutra itself requires really a thorough conversation about what uh, Patanjali is actually telling us about the state of our own minds. As uh, Sri Swami Sachitananda says, uh, Patanjali himself is a scientist. And so he is observing the human mind through the lens of a scientist, even though he was a scientist that lived 5,000 years ago. And so again, every single sutra really requires an in-depth conversation. And so on David's channel, we're able to really get into that conversation. That's why it's taking us a lot longer to go through the sutras than on my channel, because it's me just reading to you guys and then reading uh, Sri Swami Sachitananda's commentary, which I absolutely love, and then also giving my own um, experience with the Yoga Sutras. For me, the Yoga Sutras have been a part of my life for many, many, many years now. I reread them all the time. I have to study them in India. I take many classes on them in India and so yeah there's a lot of heavy discussion here about the state of our own suffering through our own thought process again with the yoga sutras is if this is your first time clicking on uh, the channel first of all welcome thank you so much for being here but I would definitely suggest starting with part one I will put part one and all the other parts before this down in the description box below so you have easy access to it once again if this is your first time um, listening to the yoga sutras or learning anything about the deeper philosophies of yoga I want to clarify that some of the Sanskrit words I am saying if they're necessary but I am not using a lot of of the Sanskrit words in this reading simply because this is a very basic reading. With that being said, the Sanskrit of the Yoga Sutras is of the utmost importance. In Ayurvedic medicine, the three elements of life are food, breath, and vibration. And of course, vibration comes through words. And with the Sanskrit words of the sutras, there's a way to chant them, which is kind of like the Lord's Prayer. It's kind of like something you can do to help um, the alchemy of the teachings already start to take effect in your body before even executing a physical practice. And so it is of the utmost importance. When I teach the Yoga Sutras live in, in my courses, I do go over the Sanskrit. So I want to make that very, very, very clear. Um, again, I've gotten a lot of people reaching out who are starting their yoga journey, and I am so happy for you. I will do the best I can to help you find teachers in your area. I cannot be your teacher unless you actually live in Atlanta and I can see you face to face. That's the only way I can teach you. I need to be able to see you, and I need to be able to adjust you. So, um, But I will help you uh, in any way I can with the limitations that I do have being uh, away from a lot of you and just over a, a platform like YouTube. I'll do the very best I can, but once again, you do need to have your own teacher. All right, so with that being said, we ended last week uh, with Sutra 29, and we're actually gonna reread Sutra 29 again, just to refresh our memory. We're still in the first pada, which is the Samadhi pada. There's four padas in the Yoga Sutra. So here we go, uh, Sutra 29. From this practice, all obstacles disappear and simultaneously dawns knowledge of the inner self. So again, we've talked about this a lot. I mean, this is like beating a dead horse in yoga. We have these three different elements of life uh, in the Yoga Sutras, which is Prakriti, Purusha, and Ishvara. Prakriti is nature. It's anything that has a birth, a life, and a death. And because it has a birth, a life, and a death, that means that it's always changing. Ishvara is God, basically. It's our higher consciousness source, whatever vocabulary word you use to define the creator. 
that's what Ishvara is. Now, Purusha is the part of you that lives within Prakriti that is connected to Ishvara. And Purusha does not follow the same laws of Prakriti because Purusha is not nature. Purusha is eternal. It is energy that has always been and thus, therefore, will always be. And again, one of the main cruxes of Patanjali's uh, theory in the Yoga Sutras is that human suffering and human detachment from God, when we can't seem to find that connection to God, is because we confuse our own identity. We think that who we are is our nature, is our identity as a human being, when that is not who we are. That is something that's temporary. Who we are is Purusha, our soul. And the soul is not attached to or maybe even deeper than the soul, more like Atman, this, this, this spark of life inside of you that actually has nothing to do with your physical body. And so part of the practice of yoga, especially with the physical practice, the asana practice, is pushing the limitations of that physical body to intentionally trigger you so that you can observe your attachments. Because most of the attachments that we have, we don't even realize we have. They're so subconscious and so subtly ingrained within our psyche. And of course, it gets into the three different karmas that we're all dealing with. And all karma is, is action and reaction. It's your work. You have your own karma that you've built within this life, your own work and your past lives, if you believe in reincarnation. You also have your karma within your DNA. So you're carrying the action and reaction from all of your ancestors. And you also have what we call collective karma. So that's what we're all dealing with collectively on this timeline. So once again, Sutra 29, from this practice, all the obstacles disappear and simultaneously dawns knowledge of the inner self. So the more that you start to acknowledge your attachments and you start to work through them, you start to realize that you are not your physical body. And that's what he's saying here. You start to understand your inner self, your inner soul, your inner Atman. So Sri Swami Satyananda goes on to say, you get in tune with the cosmic power. By that tuning, you feel the force in you that embodies all those qualities. Get the cosmic vision, transcend all your limitations, and finally become the transcendent reality. Normally, the mind and body limit you, but by holding something infinite, you slowly raise yourself from the finite objects that bind you and transcend them. Through that, you get rid of all the obstacles and your path is made easy. This probably reminds Patanjali of the different obstru obstructions on the way, so he goes on to explain them next. So this brings us to Sutra number 30. Disease, dullness, doubt, carelessness, laziness, sensuality, false perception, failure to reach firm ground, and slipping from the ground gained. These distractions of the mind stuff are the obstacles. They are more or less like a chain. The first obstacle is physical disease. Disease makes you dull, and a dull mind will doubt everything because it doesn't want to penetrate into a thing to understand it. When doubt is there, there is carelessness, a sort of lethargic attitude or laziness. And when the mind loses the interest and alertness towards the higher goal, it has to do something else so it will slowly descend to the sensual enjoyments. Actually, all these things can be summed up as qualities of tamas, or inertia and dullness. So that makes sense too, like when you're faced with something you don't want to face, sometimes your mind tries to escape that reality by thinking of something a little bit more pleasurable. And it's all obstacles. It's all obstacles distracting you from the true work. Another obstacle is slipping down from the ground one has gained. This puzzles many people. A beginner, for example, will practice with intense interest. Every day she will feel more and more interested and feel like she is progressing steadily. She may even be proud of her progress. All of a sudden, one day she will find that she has lost everything and slipped down to rock bottom. It happens to many people. And we, if we know it as a common occurrence on the spiritual path, we don't get disheartened. Otherwise, we will say, oh, I lost everything. There is no hope for me. And we lose all of our interests. Let us know that this is a common in the case of every student. The mind can, can't function on the same level always. It has its heights and its depths. If there is going to be a steady progress, always there will be no challenge, no game in it. 
All right, this is, I'm going to stop there because I kind of giggled because we, we, we tell students about this all the time. So when a student first starts coming to the shala and they fall, or if they're falling in love with the Ashtanga practice, they go through this like honeymoon phase. It's like when you're in a new relationship, you're super excited to get up at like four o'clock in the morning. You're super excited to be in the shala with everybody else practicing. You're obsessed with the practice. You're, you're really ready to put your best foot forward and put 100% effort into your practice every single day. And that typically will last about three months. But then after that mark, all of a sudden the honeymoon uh, period wears off and it becomes really hard and really challenging. And we always tell our students, once the honeymoon period wears off, that's actually where the real practice begins. Now I practice six days a week. I am I exercise anywhere between in my asana practice two, sometimes to three hours. I sweat a lot and it's and I have a very hard practice. It's it's a very challenging practice I, I as I've built up over these years. And I'm here to tell you most days, most days I don't want to do it. Most days when my alarm goes off at like 3.30 in the morning to practice for Brahma Morta, I don't want to get up and do it. That's where discipline comes into play. Where do we get the, the word disciple from? Disciple comes from the word discipline. Discipline isn't always fun. And for years and years and years now, I have maintained that discipline. Because at the end of the day, what I'm seeking in this practice far outweighs my um, longing to sleep in, my longing to be lazy, and so that's what I have to kind of push myself on the mat to get on the mat. And some days, you know, there's some, I tell my students all the time, because this practice is so freaking challenging, I've been sore for literally 15 years now. I can't remember a time in the last 15 years where I haven't, not one part of my body hasn't been sore. I'm always sore. And it's because the body is always dropping into new um, levels and depth within itself. And the challenge becomes different. But there are days when I'm definitely more sore than the next. And those are typically the days when I actually have some of the strongest practices. And I think it's because when I am that sore, I don't have any expectation. I'm kind of, I'm really dreading it at that point because it's going to be a little painful at the beginning, especially before the blood starts pumping and the sweat starts coming. But because I have no expectations, that's when I actually feel like my body is open and mobile and strong. It's the best because it's, it's not holding on to an, an expectation that's not within its reality. And so that's just something that you always deal with. And you see it with people like that go to the gym too. I mean, something that's not super spiritual, but it's physical. They have this honeymoon fear, uh, period of going and exercising and then it wears off. And that's the trick. The trick is to continue going, continue that even when that lagging feeling comes about you where you just don't want to do it anymore and your body's sore and tired, but you have to keep going. You just have to. That's the only way you're ever going to progress and break through that rut. He goes on to say that, remember, yoga practice is like an obstacle race. Many obstructions are purposely put on the way for us to pass through. Agreed. Ding, ding, ding. This practice, especially traditional practices like Ashtanga, where there's a set series, they they actually put postures in, a, in an order that is going to like piss you off, that's going to trigger you, that's going to feel like your body is being ripped apart. That's intentional. It's a controlled, again, science experiment, like Patanjali says, so we can examine how our relationship is with the postures. You know, if I have a beginner student, I'm not going to give a beginner student student the posture Ekapadashir Shasana, which is one leg behind the head posture. That comes in second series. It's going to take five, maybe ten years of daily practice before that student is able to even attempt to do, to do that posture. However, with that being said, from the very beginning, there's always going to be these obstacles. And my teacher, David Grieg, my original teacher in Philadelphia before I started going to India, he used to say that people who struggled in the primary series, the first series of Ashtanga Yoga were the lucky ones because their karma came up early. These obstacles are not necessarily obstacles. Their work, their karma, they're, they're, that's where the juicy information lies. That's where you really learn who you are. It's not, if you're going to a yoga class to relax, then you're not going to a yoga class. That's the one thing that pisses me off about the Western perception of yoga. It's been so dumbed down. It's been so bastardized over here in the West, not just in America, but Europe, Canada, all the Western countries. You're not supposed to be relaxing in yoga. Yoga is, Patanjali, we're going to get deeper into the second pada here where he talks about the actual practice. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. You're supposed to be uncomfortable in these postures. These postures are not supposed to be comfortable. The asana, so the pot means posture on a very basic level, but it actually, the full definition of asana is a seat for meditation. 
It's easy to be in a place of peace in a posture that's easy for you. But in a posture that challenges you to be able to sit in that posture to bring your body into that shape for five long breaths and find the peace of mind and allow the, the, the mind to calm down when it hates what it's doing, that's yoga. That's what yoga is. Not this BS where Inya music is playing and poetry is being read. That's not yoga. That's bells and whistles, smoke and mirrors. It's not the true practice. And so, yes, the obstacles they put within the practice, you you are supposed to sweat. Tapas, that's one of the, um, in the eight limbs, that's one of the eight limbs is tapas. That means heat. If you're not sweating in your yoga practice, if your legs are not shaking, if your arms are not shaking when you're done with your yoga practice, then you did not do a yoga practice. You need to, to have this stimulation within your body. You need to create that friction because that's where you learn. That's where the obstacles arise for you to use as a way to understand yourself. I hope that makes sense. So he's absolutely correct here. I'm going to read that first line again of this commentary. Remember, yoga practice is like an obstacle race. Many obstructions are purposely put on the way for us to pass through. They are there to make us understand and express our own capabilities. We all have that strength, but we don't seem to know it. We seem to need to be challenged and tested in order to understand our own capacities. In fact, it is the natural law. If a river just flows easily, the water in the river does not express its power. But once you put an obstacle to the flow by constructing a dam, then you can see its strength in the form of tremendous electrical power. Boom, there you go. And I will tell you guys, my teacher in India, and in the practice of Ashtanga Yoga, you're looking at extreme uh, mobility, extra legs. I mean, we throw our legs behind our head so many times. We're having to do the proper back bends where you drop back and catch your ankles. Um, it literally starts to look a bit like an exorcism at some points in some of these series. But it, but even though we have that extreme level of mobility in Ashtanga that we're seeking, you will never hear a proper Ashtanga teacher tell you to get more flexible. But daily, you will hear teachers tell you to get stronger get stronger, get stronger. You will be in a handstand balancing and the teacher will be yelling at you to get stronger because that's where you find that power it, through that physical strength of the practice. And also a lot of these deep, intense flexibility postures that people see as flexibility, which are actually mobility, the reason why the student is able to execute these extreme postures six days a week is because they're strong. If you're not strong, you're not going to be able to maintain this practice. Your body's going to break. You know, and actually as a teacher, I I am I prefer to have a student come in that's really tight than a student that's hypermobile. The student that's hypermobile is going to be the one to be most likely to be injured. The student that's high, that's super tight is the one that's most likely to open up enough where the benefit of the practice is going to be continually growing for them, if that makes sense. And, and flexibility itself is like strength. The more you work it, the more flexible you get. All right, let's move to uh, sutra number 31. Accompaniments to the mental distractions include distress, despair, trembling of the body, and disturbed breathing. Okay? There are symptoms that we all sometimes experience which prevent concentration and meditation. This is where we have to take care of our day-to-day -day activities, movements, and associations, and diet. We shouldn't allow the body and the mind to become tosmic. They should always be sattvic which sattvic is tranquil condition. That cannot be created all of a sudden by meditation alone. So we have to take care of all these things in our daily life. A sickly body can never be fit to sit, but such things will not happen if we keep our body in proper condition by right diet, exercise, proper rest, and if we do not allow it to be lazy or dull. Okay, so what he's saying here is that this comes down to like nutrition too. And a lot of Teachers kind of will talk about this. I'm not a nutritionist. I am a vegetarian. That's a huge part of my practice just in my own spiritual life is to be a vegetarian. 80% um, of India is vegetarian. And it also goes, comes down to your dosha as well, which we have spoken about on this channel before. And I do believe I'm actually going to be doing a show with Jean-Claude over on Beyond Mass. Beyond Mystic over the doshas coming up in the future because it's super important. You know, especially like for me, I only drink maybe once or twice a year. And that is because there's no way that I could maintain the practice that I have if I were to have a glass of wine every night. I just, I would not be able to do it 
at all. I could not get up at 3.30 in the morning and continue to push my body. And I think a lot of people can understand that. You know, if you've ever been an athlete or been a part of, you know, the cross training or anything like that, your body can't be both. Like you can't have a social life where you drink every night and then also have a life where you're pushing your body to its limits. The body will start to re reject it because it can't it can't function off of that alcohol. And I'm not against drinking at all. I mean, hello, I'm from the South. We all sip our whiskey and scotch on the front porch while we swing. You know, I mean, that's that's not I'm not against it. It's just you have to kind of pick and choose. And the same comes for food. Uh, for example, I stop eating every day around 5 p.m. I don't eat past 5. And that gives my body a chance to quiet my digestive system overnight so that when I get up in the morning to practice, my stomach's completely empty. Now, if I were to have a big meal at night, and then get up in the morning and do a, a big major practice, it would be like bad news bears. Like I, I can't, it's the worst feeling in the world when you can actually feel your dinner still in your stomach and all the intense twisting and you just, that food just starts coming up and you taste it. So basically what I do, my biggest meal of the day is like lunch time. Um, that's my biggest meal. And then after that, I kind of wind it down so that I can be in the perfect, um, as, as well as the perfect condition to practice the next morning. And um, we actually on moon day, so we don't practice on moon days. And whenever we have a moon day, the night before that moon day where the practice is canceled, we always call it yogi night out where we actually get to go out and enjoy a meal together sometimes because we can't do that most of the other times of, of the year. So, so yeah, and this is not anything that you guys don't know. I mean, we, we kind of know that health is super important and your vitamins and your minerals and what you're, you're giving your body is what's going to help your body fuel it to be able to do the deeper work in this practice. So this brings us to sutra number 32. The practice of concentration on a single subject is the best way to prevent the obstacles and their accompaniments. The point here is that should we, not, we should not keep changing our object of concentration. When you decide on one thing, stick to it whatever happens. There is no value in digging shallow wells in a hundred places. Decide on one place and dig deep. Even if you encounter a rock, use dynamite and keep going. If you leave that to dig another well, all the first effort is wasted and there is no proof you won't hit rock again. Before you start digging, analyze well and find out which spot is good. Then once you decide and begin, you should not question it further. Go right at it because it will be too late then to think whether it is worthwhile or not. You should have done that before. So I'm going to pause right there. This is a big uh, thing in India. They say this all the time. Uh, What's the saying? Let me think of how the saying goes. Many wives, certain death. Many doctors, certain death. Many teachers, certain death. And so you have to pick a lineage of yoga and stick to it. That's another thing I have against the um, the Western perception of yoga is they combined all these different philosophies, whether they know it or not. And it's causing, a, excuse my language, but a clusterfuck for the student because you have to stick to one specific lineage and go with that. Um, again, I'm Ashtanga. I picked the Ashtanga lineage. It's one of the Patanjali systems. There's Iyengar. There's Sivananda. You can look at the Tantric system. There's all these different systems. So you have to find the one that works for you. And if you're at the beginning of your yoga journey, then it's a beautiful time to go experiment with different types of lineages to see which one resonates with you the most. But if you keep hopping around between lineage to lineage to lineage, you're not going to get anywhere. It's, you're, you're not going to go through the dark night of the soul ever because you're never going to be able to get break through to the other side. So I hope that makes sense. So he goes on to say, even if it's a long route, your perseverance will make it short. Our aim is to make the mind steady. So it is immaterial what object we take. Anything can take you to the goal because you are not concentrating on the object for the sake of the object, but for the sake of your goal. The object is only a symbol of that. We should always remember this. All of our ideas, objects, or even mantras are just symbols to hold on to as aids towards the goal. Behind the object, you should always remember the goal. Taste, temperance, and capacities differ. So you should not criticize another's object of meditation because you have selected another. He is approaching the same goal through his objects. Just as you have confidence in your object, he too has that confidence in his way. We should not disturb the other person's faith. Not let ourselves get disturbed from our faith. Stick to one thing and force forge ahead with that. Why do you want to have this one-pointed concentration? To make the mind clear so you can transcend it. You are not going to cling to the object, but just use it as a ladder to climb up. Once you have reached the roof, you leave the ladder behind. Now in the following sutra, Patanjali gives suggestions for attaining and maintaining 
this one pointedness. We can easily see what a broad outlook he has. He is interested in the goal and not the paths. He doesn't try to squeeze you into one particular path. He only gives you a few suggestions and ultimately says that none, that if none of these satisfy you, select whatever you want. He is that liberal. That is why yoga is appreciated by everyone. No one can deny that yoga philosophy because it has something to suit everyone. And that's uh, there's an Ashanga teacher out there that always says this, and I've said this before on one of my shows before, all the trees in the forest look different, but they're all reaching up towards the same light. So that's kind of what he's saying. But you pick, pick to that one tree. Don't skip around. Pick to that one. All right, so this brings us to sutra number 33. By cultivating attitudes of friendliness towards the happy, compassionate for the unhappy, delight in the virtuous, and disregard towards the wicked, the mind stuff retains its undisturbed calmness. So he goes on to say, whether you are interested in reaching samadhi or plan to ignore yoga entirely, I would advise you to remember at least this one sutra. So samadhi, again, is the, this is the samadhi pada. It's the oneness with God. It will, it will be very helpful to you in keeping a peaceful mind in your daily life. You may not have any great goal in your life, but just to try to follow this one sutra very well, and you will see its efficiency. In my own experience, this sutra became my guiding light to keep my mind serene always. Who would not like serenity of mind always? Who would not like to be happy always? Everyone wants that. So Patanjali gives four keys, friendliness, compassion, delight, and disregard. There are only four kinds of locks in the world. Keep these four keys with you always. And when you come across any one of these four locks, you will have the proper key to open it. What are these four locks? Sukha, Dukkha, Punya, and Apunya. The happy people, the unhappy people, the virtuous, and the wicked. At any given moment, you can fit any person into these four categories. When you see a happy person, use the friendliness key. Why should Patanjali say this? Because even 4,000 years ago, there must have been people who were not happy at seeing other people. It is still the same way. Suppose someone drives up in a big car and parks in front of her huge house and gets out. Some other people are standing on the pavement in the hot sun getting tired. How many of those people will be happy? Not many. They will be saying, see that big car? She's sucking the blood of the laborers. We come across people like that. They are always jealous. When a person gets name, fame, or high position, they try to criticize that person. Oh, you don't know? Her brother is so-and-so. She must have pulled some strings somewhere. They will never admit that she might have gone up her, by her own merit. By that jealousy, you will not disturb her, but you will disturb your own serenity. She simply got out of the car and walked into the house, but you were burning up inside. Instead, think, oh, such a fortunate per person. If everyone were like that, how happy the world would be. May God bless everybody to have such comfort. I will also get that one day. Make that person your friend. That response is missed in many cases, not only between individuals, but among nations. When some nation is prospering, the neighboring country is jealous of it and wants to ruin its economy. So people should always have a key of friendliness when we see happy people. And what are the next lock, the unhappy people? Well, Swami said everybody has his own karma. He must also have done some wretched thing in his last birth. Let him suffer now. That should not be our attitude. Maybe his sup Maybe he is suffering from previous bad karma, but we should have compassion. If you can lend a helping hand, do it. If you can share half of your loaf, share it. Be merciful always. By doing that, you will retain the peace and poise of your mind. Remember, our goal is to keep the serenity of our mind. Whether our mercy is going to help that person or not, by our own feeling of mercy, at least we are helped. Then comes the third kind, the virtuous people. When you see a virtuous man, feel delighted. Oh, how great he is. He must be my hero. I should emanate his great qualities. Don't envy him. Don't try to pull him down. Appreciate the virtuous qualities in him and try to cultivate them in your own life. And lastly, the wicked. We come across wicked people sometimes. We can't deny that. So what should be our attitude and difference? Well, some people are like that. Probably I was like that yesterday. Am I not a bad, better person now? She will probably be all right tomorrow. Don't try to advise such people because wicked people seldom take advice. If you try to advise them, you will lose your peace. That is so true. I mean, look at what we've all been going through trying to convince people that are supporting wickedness that they are wrong. You end up losing your own peace, you know, and, and that's something that you need to hold on to because at the end of the day, it's, it's all God's cosmic energy anyway. And so he's right about that. 
If you try to advise them, you will lose your peace. Sometimes we come across such monkeys, and if you advise them, they take it as an insult. They think you are proud of your position. If you sense even a little of that tenacity in somebody, stay away. He or she will have to learn by experience. By giving advice to such people, you will only lose your peace of mind. Is there any other category you can think of? Patanjali groups all the individuals in these four ways. Happy, the unhappy, the virtuous, and the wicked. So have these four attitudes, friendliness, compassion, gladness, and indifference. These four keys should always be with you in your pocket. If you use the right key with the right person, you will retain your peace. Nothing in the world can upset you then. Remember, our goal is to keep a serene mind. From the very beginning of Patanjali Sutras, we were reminded of that, and this sutra will help us a lot. And so we're going to stop. That's a great place to stop. Again, we only went through like four sutras, but they, they offer a lot of conversation per sutra. So once again, guys, if you want to join us for the live conversation, there is a link to David's platform down in the description box below. We are taking a break from reading through the missing books of the Bible to read through the Yoga Sutras. This was David's idea. This was not my idea, but I'm super grateful for David that we're taking the chance to do that. Once we get through the Yoga Sutras, we will be returning to the Book of Enoch. Um, the second hour, so from 1 to 2 Eastern Standard Time, that's when we're going through the Yoga Sutras. The second hour from 2 to 3 is when we're digging into these like fundamentalist uh, groups in Christian, the Christian world. Uh, we are now talking about Michael and Debbie Pearl. We're reading through the book To Train Up a Child, which is one of the most god-awful pieces of literature I've ever read in my whole entire life. It is literally teaching you how to A-B-U-S-E, your own child, in the name of God. And so we're breaking that down right now with Michael and Debbie Pearl. I will not be able to do any of that on YouTube because of the subject matter. YouTube would like probably take my channel down if I read through that. That's how bad their book is. So um, so if you want to join us with that, that link is down below. It is a couple of bucks a month, I think, to join his platform. He used to be up on YouTube. However, YouTube purged him with a lot of other people last year. And so those couple bucks a month for his platform do go to support the platform, to pay for the maintenance of the platform. And I do know that he gives a portion of that away as well to help children who are in need. So anyway, that is down below in the description box. Um, thank you again to everyone. I'm so excited. We have so many new patrons and producers on this channel. I just reached out to you all you guys this morning. I'm super, super excited to get to know you and to meet you all. And if you are a producer on this channel, please send me your businesses um, so that I can promote you and help you grow your business, especially since we're getting close to the holidays. We want to make sure we're promoting these small businesses and helping each other out because this is the way of the future, right? We want to help each other. And so please send me all your information so I can get that up on my channel for you. All right, guys. Um, I hope that you're all having a wonderful day, and I'll talk to you soon.